Hi, I'm uh, glad you could all make it today. Um, we're living in a really exciting time right now because what we're seeing is a, a wide ranging uh, adoption of data driven and information driven decision making. Uh, it's we're seeing it across all industries. Um, and with the rise of AI in the last little while, in fact, if anything, it's accelerated the whole process. Uh, it's all been driven by the the rise of the internet, the fact that nowadays through the internet, we have uh, in machine readable form, kind of uh, a uh, the common knowledge of, of almost all of mankind. And now we're seeing AI systems, which can take that and, and boil it down into a set of models that uh, allow us to, to easily access that knowledge in, in ways that we haven't been able to before. Um, and as well by the ever increasing power of uh, computation, which has allowed these kinds of really sophisticated models to be possible. The programming language that's driving a huge amount of this innovation is of course Python. And that's uh, what we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, we're seeing an explosion of new applications, uh, many of them in, in Python and strong demand for people who understand the techniques and, and methods around data science and artificial intelligence and are able to uh, build highly robust, reliable systems uh, using these kinds of technologies. Um, so uh, for today, uh, we're going to uh, show you some of the things uh, that you can do with Python. And then after that, uh, wrap up with a, a little more information about our program uh, in data science. So, Delina, if you'd like to take it away. Sounds good. So, hi, everybody. My name is Delina. Um, I've been teaching in this program for a couple of years now, a few years now. Um, I particularly teach the Foundations of Data Science course and the Machine Learning course at U Waterloo. Uh, personally, I'm currently a director of analytics at a company called Misplay. We are a mobile gaming um, loyalty provider. And so in our courses, we usually try to provide lots of real world examples and, and make all of the things we're learning very relevant to industry and uh, how some of these techniques apply. So in terms of, um, I wanted to share a few examples today of how, what you'll learn in the class. So we're going to do a bit of a live demo just to um, walk you through some of the main Python functions that you might come across. Um, and then I'll show you some completed notebooks that will give you a sense of the types of content that um, you pick up as part of the program. So if you have any questions throughout, feel free to post them in the chat and I'll answer them as we go. And if somebody can give me a thumbs up that you can see my screen okay. Thumbs yes. up. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so this is uh, this is Colab. This is called a Colab Google Colab notebook, and a notebook is basically a. Um, a tool that we use to write Python code and to conduct analysis. So as Larry mentioned earlier, um, you know, we're, we're dealing with a lot of really big data right now. So in the digital world, again, if you work with any digital products, like where I work at Misplay or something like Netflix or Facebook, um, these digital platforms are creating billions and billions of data points every single day for every single user. And so the reason we use Python to analyze data that's this big is because Excel, I'm sure many of you are aware that Excel maxes out at about a million rows. Um, and so we don't really have uh, other closed form tools that can explore really big data very efficiently. And so Python is the tool that a tool of choice that we typically use for, for this type of work. Um, now, a notebook is the environment that we write Python code in. So the same way that you can't just randomly start typing on your computer, you typically need to open Microsoft Word or Google Google uh, Docs or something like that. Uh, same idea with, with a Jupyter Notebook. Um, if we want to write Python code, we typically need an environment in which to write the code. So this is, uh, this is a, one of the environments that we typically use in our courses. Uh, of course, there's other tools that you can use, which we'll introduce you to in the, in the program. Um, now, typically when we start with an analysis, um, we'll work with various libraries. So some of the common libraries in uh, Python are going to be NumPy, uh, pandas, uh, pandas as pd, import matplotlib, pyplot, pyplot as plt, um, and seaboard. So these are some of the popular libraries that we use as part of the program. 
Um, NumPy and Pandas are libraries for manipulating data sets, and Matplotlib and Seaborn are libraries for uh, creating visualizations. And so with these two libraries, along with the core Python programming language, or with these four libraries with the core uh, Python programming language, um, we can pretty much conduct an end-to-end -end analysis. Uh, we can identify insights in data, um, and, and we can draw some conclusions from data. And so that, you know, typically is the process that we would go through before we get into sort of machine learning learning and, and some of the more complex modeling initiatives. So as a very simple example of the types of things that we'll learn in the course, first we're going to learn how to work with different types of objects, for example, lists and tuples. So lists and tuples are two types of data storage objects that Python works with. Um, sets are another type of object uh, which can store unique values. So for example, if you have any duplicates, um, we'll learn how to store unique values. Now, objects in Python are um, ways that we organize information. So if we think about, let's say, customer data or a business problem where you have many different data points, um, you can organize that information in a table, for example, or a really long list, or in this case, a tuple in a set. So there's many different types of objects that we can use with Python. And to Larry's point, because when we build complex machine learning models and data science systems, we have to build them very efficiently because we are processing such large amounts of data. And so being able to work with and manipulate different types of objects in Python is really important. And being able to select the objects that are going to be more efficient um, in working with certain data types. So in this example here, I have a list, a tuple, and a set. So these are three types of uh, objects that exist in the sort of native Python um, language without using any libraries. Um, and with these objects, we can now do a variety of things. So we can isolate data points, for example. Um, you know, let's say that I simply want to look at the first data point in my list. I can use uh, a function syntax, functional syntax to isolate this this preliminary data point. Um, I can perform various operations on lists. For example, I can append new values. Let's say I want to add three to the end. Um, and now I can have a new list that will that will have a number of three at the end. Um, I can loop through each element of the list. So for example, if I wanted to isolate each element and uh, perform some sort of operation, I can type a quick loop for i in list one, print uh, i times two, for example, and this will output each of the elements multiplied by two. Um, so while this may seem a little bit abstract, um, if you think about the analysis process, uh, typically we go through a process of identifying a business problem, um, bringing in some data related to a business problem, transforming that data in different ways, perhaps iterating through that data, applying some sort of, um, you know, let's say lookups or matching mechanisms. Uh, th these types of activities are pretty common in, in data analysis. So techniques like uh, manipulating data within a list, um, looping through data, identifying specific data points um, that we want to work with, uh, and, and performing specific data level, data point level transformations. These are common applications um, that we we can also do in Python, just as we can do them in, in Excel or other tools like that. Okay. Um, so this is a quick example of, of just some objects that we're going to learn um, to work with. Now, I do want to also share a couple of other more complicated examples of where we will sort of go in the course. So as a um, basic, let me quickly pull this session here, um, as a basic, a basic demonstration of some of the libraries that we work with. So again, matplotlib is a visualization library. Um, Pandas and NumPy are libraries we typically use for data analysis. So a typical analysis could look something like this. Um, typically, we will import a file from an external data source. So whether that's a SQL database or data warehouse um, or a CSV file, maybe an API that you might connect with externally, wherever your data lives, uh, we'll, we'll import that in the Python environment. So in this course, we'll learn how to access data. In the, all of the four courses, we'll learn how to access data available in different sources. Um, when we access data, We'll typically store data in, again, in different objects. So the objects could be things like lists where we just have a sequential set of data points stored. And um, we also can use objects like data frames, which are probably a little bit more familiar to anyone that's worked uh, with data in the past. So tables, rows, columns, um, different types of data points, numbers, categories, and things like that. 
Um, we will learn various data manipulation techniques. So for example, how to organize data, how to sort it, how to slice and dice. Um, and then we're also looking at how to visualize data. So in this example here, uh, we can create visualizations that will tell us any patterns in data that, that might exist. So in this example, we are using Matplotlib. We have a line graph that will show us um, how the trend of data over time. Uh, we can customize our plots. So Python's quite powerful. We can create custom plots with various backgrounds, um, various colors, various sizes. And again, you learn all the different functions for, for how to build those. Um, in the second example, we've also added some labels to our plot. Um, again, we'll look at different ways of how to combine uh, code together or lines of code together to create um, completely customized um, plots and analyses that can help us uh, that can help us understand data. Um, and another example, this is another example of using a bar chart, uh, vertical bar chart, horizontal bar chart, another horizontal bar chart. Um, and then in these examples here, we are isolating and filtering a data frame for specific conditions. So the same way that you might filter a data frame in Excel or a table in Excel, um, we can do that with Python as well. So we can isolate specific uh, customers, for example, or specific values within a column. We can isolate specific columns that we're interested in. Um, and then we can plot uh, different views or so we can slice and dice data uh, in different ways that might be valuable for us. Um, we can also, if you're familiar already with SQL or you have a background um, with SQL or Excel, you'll find that there's a lot of overlap, again, in the type of functionality. So, for example, in SQL, you may use a group by function to create a pivot table of data. In Excel, you have a similar functionality where you can create a pivot table that gives you a categorized view of your data set. Um, so we'll do that in, in Python using a group by function. So again, if you've been exposed to SQL before, this, this probably is quite familiar of a concept to you. Um, if not, then we can, we can connect that to a different concept you might be familiar with, like a pivot table. So in this case here, we are grouping data. So we're organizing data by by transaction type, and then we're calculating a summary statistic. In this case, it's the sum or the total by transaction type in this particular example. And again, we can we can add plots to that. Um, and we'll learn different techniques. So again, when we talk about code efficiency, we'll look at many different ways that you can achieve the same goal. I would say that, for, at least from my experience with using Python, um, there's no right or wrong answer. There are many different ways to arrive at a solution with code. And so um, in these courses, we'll explore different libraries, different techniques, different functions that you can use to accomplish the same thing, uh, focusing on efficiency. So again, um, if we're trying to write efficient code, sometimes some functions are a little bit easier to use, but maybe not as efficient. Others might be a little bit more complex, but perhaps offer a uh, greater efficiency, uh, greater efficiency in the process. Okay, so I will take a quick pause there. Any questions so far before I continue? Okay, cool. Um, in terms of how we progress through the course content, so the course will start or the certificate will start and Larry will talk about this in a little bit, but in the certificate, we'll typically start with learning the basics of Python um, and then we'll move on to learning uh, data analysis basics. So we'll get into statistics, we'll get into machine learning and how to actually understand and build various models within, uh, within Python. So in this next example, uh, this is an example of building a machine learning model. So um, maybe you've you've had some experience or exposure to machine learning in the past. Um, the other reason Python is a really popular language and probably the most popular language in industry right now is because it makes it really easy to build all kinds of machine learning models. Um, machine learning models can be very complicated, like ChatGPT and all of these really cool AI products that are coming out in the world right now. Um, but they are also often used in day-to-day -day work. So for example, in my role right now, my team supports uh, marketing analytics, product analytics. We have the entire analytics function of our company. And so the types of models that we typically build will be things like lead scoring models, media marketing mix models, for example, customer propensity models. Um, you know, So if we have business questions, like let's say if we have a million dollars of marketing spend that we can spend in a year, how much should we allocate to YouTube versus billboard ads versus television? Um, so these are the types of questions that we can typically answer with um, uh, we can typically answer with machine learning models or data science models. And so Python makes it really easy for us to build uh, to build these types of models. 
Um, can you suggest platforms to practice Python in data science projects given one has intermediate skills? Yeah, if you have intermediate skills, um, I, I'm not sure if there's any particular platforms, but there's tons of data sets and problems, especially on Kaggle. So if you're not familiar with Kaggle, um, companies will often post challenges on Kaggle and you will uh, you can download data sets. So they'll typically upload data sets and then you can work to solve those particular problems, I would say that's probably the best platform um, that I could recommend. Um, and otherwise, there's tons of free and open data available any way that you can you can practice with. So I, I hope that's that's helpful. Uh, is it possible to skip Python basics in the program and start with machine learning and data analytics? So for the full certificate, you do have to take all the four courses to get the certificate. Um, that said, I believe you can start with any one of the courses. If you're looking to just do some of the courses, um, you can, it's an open registration, so you can register, um, you can register into any course at a, any time. Jasmine? Just wanted to make a quick note. So you can take all four courses separately if you wanted, but the foundations of data science is a prereq to all the other courses. So you do need to take that first, and then you can go ahead and choose whichever one you want to take in which order. But we do suggest taking all four of them in the order that we say it on our description. Just wanted to say that. Thank you. I, I can add a little bit of additional commentary on that as well. Um, it is possible to get an exemption for one of the courses out of the certificate program if you have uh, prior experience, uh, either academically or, or industry, that is equivalent to the content of the course, uh, but it is for the entire course. So the, the foundations course uh, spends about three weeks on introduction to Python, and after that gets into data analytics and SQL and uh, uh, a number of other topics. And so um, if you if you have essentially everything that's covered in that course, you could uh, uh, apply for an exemption. There is a process for doing that. There's a, a $150 charge for uh, getting an exemption from the course. Um, but if it's just the Python piece and you want the other parts of that course, you do have to uh, have to take the course. The exemption is on a whole course uh, basis. Thank you, guys. Okay, um, so we'll do just a quick example here and then we'll get to the rest of the questions later. Um, so in this example here, we're building a classification model. So a classification model, there's many different types of machine learning models that we can build. So again, um, what you may have seen more recently would be things like uh, ChatGPT. So these are some of the big AI models. These are deep learning models. They're very, very complicated. We do touch on a bit of deep learning. So a quick introduction in deep learning in the machine learning course as part of the certificate. There is also a follow on certificates focused on AI and NLP and some of these more complex fields that after you're done the data science certificate, you could pursue some of those as well. Um, Larry can provide some, some more context there. Uh, but in this course, we are going to cover um, the basics around building machine learning models. So uh, in foundations, we'll get a quick introduction to machine learning. And then in the machine learning course, we'll look at the most popular out of the box models. So in this example here, we're building a classification model. We're using the scikit-learn library, which is the most popular library for building machine learning models in Python. Um, there are many things that we'll cover, including how to actually evaluate models, um, how to build them in Python, how to know that they're working well, what is the math and stats behind some of these models, how do they actually work and make predictions and decisions. Um, in this example, we will, we're will we loading an IRIS data set. This is a popular classification data set. And once again, we're using pandas for to create a data frame for, uh, for the data. Um, and then here are some examples of visualizing our data. So again, exploratory analysis that we typically learn in the Foundations of Data Science course will give you the foundational steps that you could, should take every single time you're building a machine learning model or solving an analytics problem. So we'll typically visualize data. We will go through some quick, quick insights um, from the data to try to identify any relationships or patterns. Um, the purpose of machine learning is to try to teach machines how to make decisions and effectively to automate decision making as much as we can. So um, the process of 
uh, teaching machines how to make decisions really has to do with us understanding what underlying patterns exist in the data. And so we can only do that when we are exploring data uh, very thoroughly. So in this example here, we have, uh, we obviously we can see that between three different types of flowers. So the IRIS data set is a famous um, data set for flowers. I don't know if anybody is a gardener here, but you can plant iris flowers. They're really, really pretty little flowers. And there's a few different types of iris flowers that um, you can plant. And so this visualization is trying to see if there are physical differences between different types of flowers. So by plotting the data and by plotting, um, comparing the characteristics of different types of flowers, we can quite clearly see that there is a distinction between uh, the type zero, type one, and type two. Um, in this example, uh, the next row of code here, we're converting our data frame into a NumPy array. So again, on the con concept of efficiency, uh, sometimes data frame objects are much easier to work with, but they are much less efficient than arrays. And so when we build machine learning models, we do typically um, want to build arrays, which we can then feed into a machine learning model. Uh, and then we're applying some popular techniques like splitting our data set into a training set and a testing set. Um, we're establishing a model. So we're establishing a machine learning model. In this case, we're using the K nearest neighbor classifier, which is a really popular classification technique. Um, we're teaching, we're fitting the model. So we are teaching the model how to make decisions. And then we're using the trained model to make some predictions on data that it's never seen before. And finally, we are evaluating how well the model works. So if we were to put this model out into the world and ask it to classify iris flowers for us, um, we are, we're basically measuring how well is that model able to make classifications for us. And so that's where we get some of these um, metrics like accuracy score, which is a popular metric for evaluating classification models. And finally, in this example, we are um, basically testing a whole bunch of different parameters for a model. So this is called hyperparameter tuning, where we're trying to figure out what are the best settings that we can set for our model in order to achieve the most accurate result. And so in this case here, we are testing a whole bunch of different settings. We're using a loop to um, go through the model uh, many, many different times. And then we're printing the average accuracy so that we can decide what is the best parameter to set for this uh, particular model, okay? So I hope that this um, provides some, uh, I hope that this provides some insights. Uh, hopefully it's okay if I can answer some questions now. Um, I think there was a question around, uh, I'll let, I'll let uh, the Waterloo folks answer the questions around credits in academic history and job placements, but specifically for the machine learning course, um, good question, Jess, on what do, are we going to learn in that course? Um, so yes, we will cover different types of scenarios and when to use particular models um, in the machine learning course. So we'll look at, for example, all the different out-of-the-box models that are available to you and various business scenarios and how you might apply each model to each business scenario. Mm -hmm. um, we use real data in all of our courses. So we typically will source data that's real, that's reflective of the real world. Um, and we will use that data in all of our courses. So you should be working with uh, real data that you would come across in the real world. Um, and in terms of uh, the ethics of and risk, I'm assuming that you mean maybe ethics around applying models in a real world, world scenario. Um, yes, we will cover that. So how do we make decisions, not just from how a model performs once we build it in Python, but also what is sort of the offline performance of that model? So how do we know that this model is going to be good for the business problem? How do we know that it's it's relevant? Okay. So I hope that helps. Um, and then let's look at some other questions. In terms of time commitment, I, I would recommend at least 10 to 20 hours uh, a week of dedicating to the course. Um, data science is a really complicated field because it's really a mix between computer science, statistics, math, business acumen. And so you do have to spend quite a bit of time learning many different skills, especially if you don't have those um, backgrounds. So for example, if you don't have a computer science background and you're learning programming for the very first time, uh, I would suggest spending maybe 10 to 20 hours a week to learn, uh, to, to focus on, on building those Python skills because they are gonna be important through the entire program. And also if you do want to work in analytics and data science, um, these skills are fairly critical for your day-to-day -day work. 
Um, if you have a computer science background, maybe you're already familiar with programming and you know, you, maybe you don't have a statistics background, then that's probably an area to focus on. Again, 10 to 20 hours a week. Um, and if you're new to all of these fields, then again, we do cover, we do start at the basics in the program, but you should be spending 10 to 20 hours a week to, to work with the material. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of great questions here, and I think some of them will be answered by uh, the upcoming next few slides, and uh, and um, and then after that we'll we'll continue with uh, Q and A. So, um, so why don't we? Thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks, Dr. Lino, and uh, we can uh, bring up the next slide. Okay, so um, a few comments about, like, I, I know some of you are, are interested in uh, moving into this field from other fields. Um, it's, it's interesting running a program like this because we have a wide variety of people who, uh, who come to take the program, ranging from people who have never done any programming uh, or analytics work previously at all, to uh, people who have uh, PhDs in the hard sciences. We, we have uh, physicists and chemists who uh, have decided to retread themselves in, uh, in data science. And so um, it, it's quite a wide variety, quite a, um, an interesting collection of people and backgrounds and experience that come together. Uh, um, and so, um, it's a challenge for us. We work very hard to make these programs interesting and useful for a very broad audience. Um, ultimately, to work in data science requires a, a lot of specific skills, and we address as many of these as, as we can. Um, although typically a data scientist has experience um, and some knowledge in all of these areas, they tend to specialize in maybe three of them where they uh, perhaps have prior, uh, prior training, prior skills or work experience or particular knowledge or interest and, and dive into and, and become very strong in those particular ones. Um, but there is a, a need really to be rounded in, in quite a variety of different things. Some of the most important ones, understanding of uh, statistics and, and machine learning, what are the actual techniques and, and how do you use them correctly? Um, it's become commoditized to a certain extent nowadays where so much of the, the uh, uh, model capability is, a, is available in systems that are kind of, you plug in your numbers and a result comes out, but you have to be very careful about using them. You have to understand what the appropriate circumstances are in which the, the model assumptions, and all models do have assumptions, are valid, and therefore what conclusions you can correctly make from the, the results of, of those kinds of analyses. Um, also very important, storytelling. Um, it's one thing to be able to take a data set and do an analysis and draw conclusions out of it. It's another thing to be able to effectively communicate what you've discovered in a way that is easily consumable by other people. And, and we uh, spend time on this, in, in particular in the first course, in how do, you, uh, how do you develop visualizations in a way that make it easy for people based on the way that, that uh, people's senses work to most effectively and uh, accurately allow them to see the insights um, with, with as little static as, uh, as possible and as quickly as possible. Um, so we, we cover, we touch on pretty much all of these different areas, not so much business, although we use business examples, but uh, of course people, uh, depending on the specific business that they're in, will bring uh, that kind of business expertise with them. Uh, next slide, please. So you, you've probably gathered by now, there are four courses, foundation, statistics, machine learning, and the last one, uh, we often just refer to it as big data. It's really a data engineering course. It's about how to scale up the kinds of techniques that are covered in the other courses to massive data sets, um, terabytes of data, um, and, uh, and potentially, although not necessarily, um, and what's involved in, in building truly robust, very high volume processing kinds of systems. 
Um, so next slide, please. Some of our instructors. So one of the things that makes this different from uh, uh, a master's program in analytics, for example, is our instructors. Um, this program is it's continuing education. It's designed for people who have been out in the workforce for a while and are looking for practical application of techniques. Um, and although we, we don't skimp on the theory, the theory is all there, uh, but we don't um, we don't emphasize the theory in the same way that uh, a master's program would. We're much more roll up your sleeves, uh, much more a set of instructors who are out there in the real world doing this kind of work on a day-to-day -day basis and bring that practical experience that you don't necessarily see uh, with uh, purely academic uh, practitioners. Um, so this is just a sample of some of our people and you can see the kinds of uh, marquee companies that, that they work for um, and the, uh, the roles that they play. Next slide, please. So the first course covers Python, Pandas, uh, visualization, SQL, and so on. Um, in terms of programming experience, the, the program does not assume that you have prior programming experience, although it is beneficial. Uh, if you have no programming experience prior, then we'd recommend that you take a, a short course in either programming generally, or what might even make even more sense is in Panda, or sorry, in, in Python specifically, um, there are lots of courses that are available, um, many of them online, many of them at, at low or, or no cost, um, that would uh, just introduce you to the, uh, how programming goes. We do cover in the first three weeks, as I mentioned before, the, the syntax of Python. Um, and so uh, if you've never seen Python before, but you know another programming language, that's fine. You can uh, you learn as much about Python as you need. Uh, for uh, for the entire program in the first course. Second course um, talks about probability and inference in um, a little bit different way than maybe other statistics courses. If you've taken, if you took a stats course a few years ago um, and learned about things like regression, yeah, it, it covers those kinds of topics as well. But it also talks about probability maybe from a, a different perspective than uh, than you've uh, seen it in previous courses with a real emphasis on probabilistic graphical modeling and causal analysis, uh, new techniques for making sense out of data that have just sort of exploded onto the scene in, in the last few years. And in fact, what they demonstrate is that many of the techniques that were taught in data analysis, even like five years ago, uh, actually produce an incorrect answer if you don't take into uh, into account the causal relationships between the variables. So we talk about how to do that correctly. Um, then later courses uh, talk about machine learning, as Delina was uh, mentioning, uh, feature selection, dimensionality reduction, how to take highly complex data sets with many uh, columns in the tables and focus in on the, the variables that are, are truly uh, predictive. We do an introduction to neural nets um, in the machine learning course. Uh, there's also a question about uh, how this relates to um, the uh, AI certificate at the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies. The two programs are connected to each other. The machine learning course from this program is common to both of those certificates. If you take th this machine learning course as part of this certificate, um, you already have uh, one of the courses towards the uh, certificate in, in AI from the uh, U of T School of Continuing Studies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so Spark is a, um, a tool for analyzing. It, it's similar to Pandas, similar to uh, uh, what uh, Delina was, uh, was showing you previously, but is designed for processing huge quantities of data in the cloud as opposed to smaller data sets that can uh, fit on your laptop. We'll talk about how, in fact, spend uh, three weeks learning uh, the details of how to work with Spark. This is in the, the big data course. Talk about big data architectures in general, how to uh, stream large quantities of data from, for example, the Twitter uh, bar hose, like where we have tens of thousands of uh, tweets per second that you might want to capture and analyze. 
talk about uh, distributed databases where the data is so big that it won't fit in a single relational database. We have to split it across many databases. Um, it introduces a whole range of issues that are uh, specific to, to the fact that, the, that there are copies of the data that then have to be kept somehow in, in sync with each other. Um, and also uh, uh, new in our um, uh, big data course. Uh, we've in the past have had some content in ML operations and in cloud-based machine learning. Uh, this summer, uh, we're uh, increasing the content in those. Um, I'm going to be teaching the, the big data course this, uh, this summer. Um, next slide, please. Um, so there are some questions about the program structure. Officially, it's eight to 12 weeks. As uh, Delina mentioned, um, 12 is probably closer um, and you, you may spend more. It depends on your personal interest. It depends on whether you're planning to do what's necessary to complete the program or whether this is something that you really see as being you know, the next big thing for you and you really want to dig in. You can spend as much time as you like on it. It's a fascinating fascinating world. Um, th the way that it works is it's a combination of readings uh, provided in Jupyter Notebooks and weekly webinars. So the, the course material is self-contained. The webinars are not required uh, for people to attend. Um, the, the content of the course is all in notebooks, like Delina showed you. Um, we do have recommended readings outside of those, though. They're not Again, not required, but they, they uh, really help with the educational process. The, the webinars are intended as an opportunity to reinforce the key ideas from the, uh, uh, from the main content of the course. Um, if you can attend them, great. Uh, if you can't, you can always review the recorded versions of them at any time. The nice thing about being able to attend in person is it's an opportunity to interact with the instructors, get to know them, and, and ask uh, your specific questions um, if it's uh, if they're at a convenient time for you to do so. Um, other than that, the main interaction, if if the timing of the the uh, webinars doesn't work for you, is through the discussion boards. Uh, we have uh, online discussion boards. The instructors check them once a day. And, uh, and uh, not only will you interact with the instructors and get questions answered that way, but also all the other people uh, in the course at, at the same time as you. Um, um, many of them will answer questions as well because they may have uh, run into the same issue that you have and found a workaround or solution and, and, and will post it. At any given time, we have uh, between 300 and 500 people in the program. It's three to four assignments for each of the courses, and uh, th there's no exams as such. Instead, what we have is uh, team projects. Uh, so you'll get to know uh, some of your other classmates that way. It's uh, one of the design objectives for this program for us was to uh, allow people to, uh, to build up their networks and so this is an opportunity to, to meet other people in the program, to work with them, and, uh, and you leave the course with a few people that uh, you've gotten to know and uh, can interact with, and, and uh, you can help each other uh, in your journey later on. Next slide, please. So that brings us to the end of the formal part. Um, so let's, let's go ahead with uh, Q&A. Awesome. Thank you so much, Larry, for walking us through that. We have now entered the Q&A section. So we've had a good deal of questions coming into the chat. Um, so I would like to invite anybody who wants to unmute themselves and ask a question. You can go ahead and do that now. I'm going to give it one minute. And then if not, we can go ahead and go through the questions in the chat. Um, hi. Hello. Uh, um, um, for such program, can we use such credit hours for a master degree? Uh, uh, what? Uh, well, the, this program is separate from the academic degree programs of the universities of Waterloo and Toronto. So um, same as any other course that you might take from Wattspeed or from uh, the School of Continuing Studies at U of T. 
th these courses do not uh, have academic credit towards a uh, university degree. Yeah, I have a question here. So mm -hmm. I have a considerable experience in application development using uh, like in developing microservices, AI, uh, like uh, microservices, APIs basically. And then I want to like learn the data science and I'm a kind of a beginner. And so I'm like, uh, I have experience with Java, JavaScript, but not in Python. So uh, will this uh, be like a suitable course uh, uh, like taking this or doing the AI course? So are, how are they different, like the data science course and the AI course? Yeah, great question. So, so the difference is the data science program focuses on, uh, on training knowledge content for analysis of data sets. So this is to, uh, to pre prepare someone for a career in data science as a data scientist. So analyzing and um, providing advice to management about what course uh, uh, of action a company should take based on analysis of information that's available. So that's data science. The AI certificate program is different. It's focused uh, on, um, on deep learning applications um, and on intelligent agents and um, and uh, natural language processing and those sorts of things. So it's 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 not about data analysis. At the end of it, uh, you wouldn't have data analysis specific skills. Um, instead, uh, what you'd be prepared to do is use um, use the techniques of deep learning and reinforcement learning um, and probabilistic modeling to uh, to build agents to uh, to perform tasks of one kind or another. The, thanks, thanks for answering. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. The, the reason that they dovetail together is for someone who has uh, who needs to fill in or or update or refresh their knowledge statistics and uh, and machine learning models. Um, it it just it it forms a an excellent basis for then going on to the more advanced material in the, the AI program. Hi, this is Arijit here. And I have a follow-up question. Um, so I would like to know um, uh, which certificate uh, or um, which program um, gives us um, ability to gain expertise faster than uh, the other program. Uh, in this case, I'm talking about uh, data science program and artificial intelligence program. Well, it, it depends it depends what your end objective is. If your end objective is to be a data scientist, then the data science program is, is uh, the appropriate content. If, uh, if you want to do artificial intelligence specifically, then either the AI program, if you already uh, are, like your stat skills are strong and uh, your SQL skills and, and sort of those base skills are already strong. Um, otherwise, uh, take the data science program and, the, and then the AI program. But, but they really are for, for different audiences. Data science is for people who um, who want to do data science as a career, and AI is for people who want to do advanced, hardcore uh, kind of uh, intelligent agent kind of stuff. Yeah, so just a follow-up question on that. So currently my situation, like I'm working on a kind of a company where we kind of build cloud native APIs, which does mm -hmm. decisioning, risk decisioning. Yep. And then we have a AI team, but I'm not part of that team. I'm just a decisioning part of the team developing the APIs. So I think like maybe an AI program would be a more suitable because, uh, but I was thinking maybe it would be too advanced for me. Maybe I need to first uh, do the basic data science, but as you told, like both are like a little bit different audience, but uh, yeah, so uh, coming to the AI program. So what are the basics I need apart from learning Python? Like, well, if your um, if your stats is uh, a little rusty, I'd, I'd certainly take the stats course. Okay. okay. Uh, 
and then the machine learning courses and is common to both of them. So you could take the stats and the machine learning uh, in the Waterloo program or uh, mm -hmm. the U of T version of these, um, and then go directly into the other um, AI courses from there. Thank you. Yeah. I'll just make a quick note because I have um, quite a few questions about this. Uh, if you don't have any prior experience of Python, I did mention it in the chat, we do offer the introduction to Python 3 programming as part of what speed. It is a fast six week long course followed by a two week final exam period. So I did enter a link in the chat. So if you want to check that out, that would be a good basic course to take before starting the data science program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you could also, Larry, you could also take you could also take it in parallel with the the first course, um, but probably best if you do it first. Correct. Okay, Larry, I do have a question for you in the chat here. Will the machine learning course cover topics such as when to apply what types of models, when a model is not appropriate for solving the problem, and assessing risk of applying a model in real life scenarios? Yeah, I think Delina did already answer that question. So yes. Like, yes. <laughs> okay. So I had a question for the Watt Speed team. So uh, what is the timing of this program, like uh, when it is conducted so that uh, people full-time working can do this? Like, is it like, what is the timing on weekends or weekdays after office hours? The yes. timing of the course will be, sorry, Larry, I'll, I'll let you jump into that, but I will say it is different for each course. So once you get registered, you will get an email describing all the live sessions in the full course schedule. Yeah, so, so again, you, you don't have to attend the live sessions. You can do this completely asynchronously. Mm -hmm. um, the live sessions uh, tend to be evenings and uh, and Sunday, midday, uh, uh, Eastern Standard Time. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so, Larry, we have another question. It says, what are the aspects of Python that a data scientist must understand and master? Um, well, essentially, the things that we got in our first course. Uh, you have to understand uh, you know, basic Python syntax. Um, Python is what's uh, called a multi-paradigm language, which means you can write code, which is procedural or functional or object-oriented in, in nature. Um, so if you take a course in just Python, like a, like a big Python course or a multi-course uh, program in Python, they'll teach a lot of detail about how Python works that, that you don't really need. For data science, we really what we tend to use is very simple um, procedural Python. So you need to know the basic syntax and the basic types of collections that are available. So things like lists and sets that that uh, Delina was talking about. Um, and then um, you, you need to know the most popular libraries. So Pandas, uh, either Matplotlib or Seaborn, or there, there are a collection of other uh, nice uh, math plotting libraries that are available. So uh, in any of those uh, any of those would be good. Um, and then um, you, you need to know how to use the uh, machine learning libraries th that are available. So SK Learn is the, is the most popular one. Um, so that's that's kind of the the working set. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, somebody needs to know if. The data science and this course in particular is applicable to someone working in research and wanting to work in the biomedical sector. Um, is it applicable to someone who's doing research in biomedical? So I, I, I would say yes. Um, as I mentioned, we have people who uh, are um, PhD level researchers that have gone through the program, usually because they want to become data scientists. Um, but Certainly, uh, everything that we teach here is rigorous and could be applicable in uh, in basic research as well. Um, it's not going to be of the same flavor necessarily as what you would see if you took a machine learning or statistics, advanced statistics uh, course. 
um, through university as an academic program where the expectations for being able to demonstrate uh, math skills would be much higher than than what we require. Um, but um, so long way of saying, yes, everything we do is is rigorous. Um, and um, although the the tendency in our materials is more towards uh, business kinds of applications than scientific applications, um, it's certainly not exclusively that the case that the in every case we have lots of uh scientific examples as well thank you larry we do have one other question that was submitted previously it is what is the market outlook for data science any negative impact or potential of replacement by the rapid development of ai yeah there's this sort of yak going around about ai is going to be the end of a long list of things including potentially data science. Uh, I don't buy it for a moment. Um, the last thing you want to do is 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 take an analysis from a large language model verbatim. Um, and again, unless you understand the modeling techniques themselves and their limitations and when they're applicable, um, you run the risk of taking a of taking something that is, uh, perhaps a, a large language model says, oh, uh, this analysis produced this result, taking that result and using it, which can be extremely dangerous if you don't know the parameters under which the experiment was done um, and what uh, variables were controlled for and, and whether they were the right variables to control for. And as I mentioned before, one of the uh, uh, great additions of causal analysis is that controlling for the wrong variables actually damages the result and can lead you to a wrong conclusion. So I think, um, I mean, you know, I think this whole world is is just uh, going to continue to be as important or even more important than it has been in the past. Thank you, Larry. There is another question about the tax receipt. I will answer that very quickly. We do not offer any tax receipts. I know there is sort of a misconception about what is considered acceptable and not, but we only give tax receipts for uh, courses that require admission into the university. And because this is a non-credit course, we do not do that. Um, Larry, one question for you coming in, which is how is this program different from the data science bootcamp from U of T? Um, well, it's a fraction of the cost for one thing. <laughs> Uh, it's yeah the, with the boot camp you it's a lot of money it's uh, you have to dedicate the time so you if you have a job uh, it's an issue this is spread out it gives you a lot more opportunity to to ingest the knowledge and work with it and experiment with it and, and play with it over a period of time so that you you truly do uh, absorb it and learn how to use it um and uh, but in terms of of the content the content um although i've never kind of put them up side by side from my understanding they're uh, they're pretty similar um awesome. thank you larry for answering that um mehek would like to know if there are any real time projects as part of the course any real time real time pro projects yeah um well every Every course, all four of the courses, um, there's a project which the learners get to choose. So as a group, say you're a group of five people uh, that are, are doing the project, you get to choose whatever you like as long as it's within the, the parameters of the course. So something that demonstrates what you've learned in that particular course. Um, and it can be a real business application or or other from from your work, if you like, as long as as the, the other uh, other people on your team uh, agree to it. And as long as it um, you have uh, access to the data and can, and can share it, then you're not um, using proprietary data. Thank you, Larry. I do see another question on any financial aids that are being offered for the program. Unfortunately, we don't offer any kind of discounts or financial aid for partnership programs because this program is partnered with the University of Toronto. We cannot offer any discounts. So for now, the course fee will remain in full. Okay. Um, if anybody has any other final questions, we are coming towards the end of the session. You can feel free to unmute yourself or 
um, send it in the chat and I'll be happy to read that out for you. Awesome, I will go through one other question that came in previously before the session started, which was how can I use data science in the field of sustainability? In sustainability specifically? Um, well, I mean, generically in, in any kind of situation where, um, Where you could apply like like existing data that you have. Um, yeah, I can't say as I've really thought this through very well. <laughs> That's okay. I think from my understanding, you definitely can apply it to any field because you're learning all the skills you need to analyze big sets of data. So at the end of the day, you can use the knowledge that you gain from programming languages and different softwares like Delina mentioned before and apply it to your own industry and your own department. Um, I think that is it. Yeah, yeah, I'll just check. yeah. It's certainly, anything having to do with with maintenance of uh, natural resources in, in any way, the the statistical history of those resources uh, would allow you to predict out into the future um, what the the likely consumption of those resources is, or uh, or their degrad degradation. So, I, um. So I'm, I'm not sure that helps, but okay. no, that does help. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate that. So with that being said, we're one minute away from 1 p.m. And I just want to say that thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Larry and Delina, especially for walking us through a wonderful info session. Just a quick reminder that our next upcoming date for the course is May 29th. I will put the link, a direct link to register for the course in the chat below, and you can um, go through that as well. If you have any last minute questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves right now and we'd be more than happy to answer them. Awesome. I think we're good, Larry. Thank you so much for joining and everybody else as well. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.